can somebody tell me where we left off left off before break i know our minds are usually erased when we go on break at least mine is uh, but let's see if anybody remembers roughly where we were when we left off we threw a coin we threw a coin yes <laughs> very good i'm going to come back to this in a second thank you that's good matt did you have something else um, we're talking about the key value, the controversy yes. I pick up with where we left off with this. This is one of those things, you know, sometimes I tell you uh, that something is really important. And if you understand one of these uh, fundamental things really well, it will serve you, you know, forever. This is one of those things that you should try to understand well and remember, because uh, it's one of those things that will uh, stay with you for a long time. Um, okay. Uh, so let's see. So before coming back to p-values, I want to come uh, step back just a little bit and remind you of this notion of threats to validity or, or kinds of validity. Um, these are, uh, they are well illustrated when we talk about experiments and designing experiments, but they are much more general than this. This will come up in all other settings, even when we're not using true experiments. So I want to mention them. So you have a good sense of what they are, at least a broad sense of what they are. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on a few of them in particular. So there's four types of validity that people care about. Uh, and by the way, so, you know, you as researchers will be expected to consider all these four types of validity when you're designing and carrying out your studies. And then you as authors are probably also expected to comment on, you know, a good paper will often explicitly comment on all four of these types of validity that might affect the study you know being published um, in the paper uh, you know so that readers can have a sense of you know how uh, you know trustworthy and valid your results are or aren't so that's why i'm mentioning these here because good papers will explicitly mention this in the paper, and hopefully you'll be writing good papers yourselves, and you will be thinking and writing about these explicitly as well in your papers. Um, okay, so statistical conclusion validity is the first one. So this is sort of what the name implies. It, it implies, um, yeah. the question is, are, are the correlations and inferences and whatnot that you're um, computing the results of your statistical analyses of the data you collected, say, from running an experiment, are those valid or not? Do they actually uh, reflect the uh, uh, true relationship between your uh, treatment uh, and the outcome, for example? Okay, so issues that have to do with the validity of the statistics you're running on the data you're collecting from the experiment or otherwise. That's one. Internal validity is a second category. This is um, whether, right. So this is about uh, you know, whether the thing you're observing numerically or whatever, statistically, whether that relationship, so that covariation, that correlation, whether that actually reflects the true nature of the causal relationship between those variables. Um, and so, yeah, okay. So remember, we talked about three ingredients for establishing a causal relationship. Okay, so this is going to be that. This is going to be, you know, do you actually have all three of your ingredients? Roughly, so this is the idea for internal validity, right? To what extent the things that you have established statistically or have shown numerically, to what extent those actually reflect, you know, and, and take off the three ingredients that are needed to uh, make these causal claims. And I'm going to come back to this in more detail in a second. The third one is construct validity. Um, I obsessively insisted on how your, you know, for example, when you're building tools and evaluating them, you're not testing the tools, but rather what? Jenny. Constructs that are 
and it's not true as some Right, you're testing some hypothesis, you're testing some theory, you have some theory about how, you know, the tool is helping people do something, you know, in a more efficient way or whatnot, right? There's some underlying theory and the tool is just a means for you to test the underlying theory. You don't really care about the tool per se, but you care about the kinds of things the tool embodies because those will likely carry over to other settings that aren't literally your tool, but have the same properties, right? So it's a much stronger claim to make, right? If you can reason about sort of the theoretical constructs underlying your tool and the things you're experimenting with, rather than the things you've measured literally themselves. And okay? so, you know, let's say a good example, uh, I, am showing that there's some relationship, maybe even causal, between the number of lines of code that groups of programmers write and some characteristics of the team composition. But I show some relationship between team composition and number of lines of code. Right? The thing I'm measuring is number of lines of code. The thing I actually want to reason about is you know group productivity or something like this team effectiveness right so the construct is this theoretical construct of productivity or effectiveness but the measurement is lines of code say per unit time okay so you can see you know how there can be a huge disconnect perhaps between what you can measure and what you're actually trying to show Right? Nobody cares about lines of code per se. We want to make inferences and claims about productivity in general. And to what extent lines of code per unit time is a reasonable proxy, a reasonable measure of productivity that remains to be determined, right? So that's the question of construct validity. And then finally, we were talking about external validity. So this is when, you know, ideally you would want to uh generalize the claims you're making in your particular study setting beyond that to a, you know to a more uh, general setting a more general context but so if i study you know if i show an effect of using say copilot or something like that on uh computer science phd students at cmu right would that hold in general for programmers anywhere Right. So, the, you know, ideally, I would want to make these claims that impact more than just the computer science PhD students at CMU, but maybe all I have a chance to study are the computer science PhD students at CMU. Right. So, the question is to what extent can I actually generalize the things I'm observing on this particular sample, you know, to other groups that I might care about? Is that sort of external validity? Okay. So, these are four kinds of validity issues. Um, and the uh, Shadish Cook and Campbell book, uh, I think I assigned a few chapters as readings, uh, goes into enormous depth and detail about each uh, category with like various kinds of examples within each of those. So we won't have time to do that in class, but you know, please at least remember that there's these four uh, and so roughly what they correspond to. Uh, and you can read about them in more detail in the book. But I do want to. Yes, yeah, so we talked about construct uh, and there's more in the book. We talked about external, there's more in the book. Uh, we, right, we talked about internal. This is the ingredients for causal relationships. So yeah, here, let's talk about this for a second. A few things that can go wrong when this happens. Um, ambiguous temporal precedence, right? So remember we need for causal relationships, we need the cause to be to come before the effect, right? That was one of the three things we talked about. You know, but maybe we're not sure. Maybe it's ambiguous in our experiment which thing happened first and which thing came second. Right? So that's one source of uh, invalidity, potentially. Uh, selection biases, you know, whether there are systematic differences over conditions in respondent characteristics. Maybe you can do random assignment and you have large enough groups and these go away, but that's not always possible. So you have to account somehow for possible systematic differences between your 
you know, participants, continuous uh, respondents, right, in these different conditions. Uh, history effects, things that happen concurrently with the treatment. You know, yes, you apply the treatment, but maybe something else happened at the same time. Maybe the mere uh, fact of being treated, regardless of the treatment itself, right, that could cause, you know, a history effect uh, in the sense, and you know that could be responsible for the effect you're observing, not the active ingredients in the treatment, but rather the fact that you got, you know, uh, stabbed with a, a syringe in your arm or something. Uh, you know that could be what's causing the effect. Uh, maturation things that occur uh, naturally over time that could be confused for a treatment effect, right? So it could be that people just get better over time because they get more practice. They don't get better because they're using your tool. But they get better because they practice more over time. They would have gotten better anyway with any tool. I said that would be an example of a maturation effect that you'd have to account for. Uh, this one's interesting regression. You've heard, has anybody heard this term regression to the mean? You heard about this before? Anybody explain what this means? You want to try it? Sure. So uh, if you, um... If you're like uh, observing some sort of sample for distribution and you get an extreme value, so uh, if somebody is taking a test and they do very well, um, uh, assuming that the distribution represents that that person scores, their next score is most likely to be poor just because that's statistically what's most likely. Um, and then yeah. the, the inverse is true with like if they did very poorly on that test, they're most likely to do well on another one that is that's statistically. Yeah, that's exactly the idea. Uh, they've observed this initially with, let me see if I have a, yeah, I do have this. They've observed this initially with human height. Okay, so as it turns out that the children of really tall people are less likely to be as tall as their parents. They're probably gonna be shorter. And similarly, the children of very short people are probably gonna be taller than their parents. They could still be, you know, they could still, the children of tall people can still be tall relative to the average human height or something like this, but they're probably going to be less tall than their parents. If their parents, the more, the more extremely tall their parents are, the less likely that the, their children are going to be of similar height. And so it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, the same with test scores. If you do really well on a test, then your know, next time I test you, Chances are you won't do as well because it's really hard to maintain that streak. Yeah, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, affects outliers. Okay, attrition is when you lose people mid-study, people drop out. You know, so it could be that the people remaining become somehow fundamentally different, right, between conditions. Uh, testing effects. This seems similar to, uh, to, to history in the sense that just exposure to a test can affect your scores and, and subsequent exposures. Uh, okay, instrumentation. So there's others. The book goes into even more details about all of these. Okay, so now finally back to conclusion, statistical conclusion validity. This is where we started talking about p-values last time. Um, Okay, yeah, so there's two, uh, two things here that can uh, happen, right? Two things to, to look for. One is whether there's some correlation between your cause and effect at all. And the second, you know, how strongly do those things correlate? Um, and there's two kinds of errors that can happen here as well. Um, and this is another one of those things that is good to remember. People often refer to type one and type two errors. You'll see this a lot. It's good to know what they mean when they say this. So type one errors are happen when you incorrectly uh, conclude that there's some relationship between your cause and effect when in fact there is none. So what's another term we use to refer to this? The very commonly used one. I'm sure you've heard this. Jenny. 
That's right, false positives. Right? So in reality, there is no relationship between those variables, but your experiments discovered one falsely. So that's what this says, but right? you're incorrectly concluding that there's some relationship there when in fact, in reality, there isn't. Okay, so we call this a false positive or a type one error. Okay. The second one is type two errors. So this is when you incorrectly conclude that there isn't a relationship between those variables when in fact, in reality, there was one. What do we know? What other name do we know this by? False, False negatives. That's right. right. So, you know, in reality, there is a relationship, but you're falsely missing it with your experiment. You're not able to discover it. Okay. So, these are two kinds of errors that will haunt you for the rest of your data science career. I'm sorry. You're there's no escaping this. Okay, so, right. So here's kind of more about when they happen. So type two, the false negatives happen more when your experiment, your study has low power. You've heard this term maybe before as well. Um, and when does that, when can that happen? What's a sort of obvious, uh, scenario when you don't have enough power to discover an effect with the with your experiment. Matt. Uh, small sample size. That's right. Small sample size. That's that's really the most obvious one, right? If you just don't have enough of a sample to be able to observe differences between conditions, right? That would uh, lead you to falsely concluding that there isn't a relationship there when in fact there would be one if you just had more opportunity to observe it. Okay. Um, then all of these statistical tests that you'll be running come with their uh, long list of assumptions and whatnot. Uh, and anything can go wrong here in all directions. So you can either underestimate or overestimate the size and significance of an effect here. There's no golden rule. Um, fishing, you've heard this before also maybe, peak hacking or fishing for results. What does that mean? Lighter? We keep trying different ways of running a test on the same data until you can find something that shows a result. Right, so you keep running test after test after test. And at some point, you're, you're bound to find something that's statistically significant somewhere there. Right? So you know, the more tests you run, the more this likelihood of finding something um, grows. And I'll show, I'll show you this concretely in a second. Um, right, the measures could be unreliable. So you know, they would, might not allow you to observe the things you're actually trying to establish. Um, yeah, this is another one, uh, restriction of range and variables. This is a good source of um, you know, errors here, uh, type two errors. So a good example is when you have some uh, numerical variable, say human height, uh, and you discretize it into groups, say, you know, short people versus tall people uh, down the middle or something. Okay. So the more you you know, discretize your data, the less resolution you have to observe effects is sort of the idea. Right? So, you know, when in doubt, you're always better off with uh, uh, more fine-grained data over the less fine-grained data is the idea. Yeah. Right? So it's typically, this weakens the relationship between variables right, when you discretize. Okay. Okay, then, then we talked about, I think we talked about this a little bit right before break. We started talking about hypothesis tests and this is where the coins are gonna come back in a second. Um, so we, for significance tests, we usually uh, 
explicitly formulate hypotheses and ex explicitly formally test them um, because we want to know if random chance might be responsible for some uh, effect you're observing. And we would like to eliminate that possibility. We would want to be confident that it's not random chance responsible for the difference between people using your tool and people not using your tool. We want to really be confident that your tool does something meaningful to help people out or something like this. Not that this happens by chance. Um, right, so you, know, you form a typically a null hypothesis, call that a zero. Uh, it's basically the hypothesis that chance is to blame for the observed difference. So you, you could formulate that as say, there is no difference in mean time to complete a task using Copilot versus writing code from scratch. That's the null hypothesis, that there's no difference between conditions. Right, so, you know that any any difference, you know, if any, is just due to chance. There is no meaningful difference between the conditions. That's the null. The alternative is the counterpoint to the null. It's what you're actually hoping to prove. Now, for example, that it takes less time on average to complete tasks when people are using your smart AI compared to when they're writing code from scratch. Okay, that's the alternative hypothesis. Um, and then we started talking about p-values, and I gave you this homework to uh, invent a series of 50 point flips or, or thereabouts. And the reason I did this is to prove the following point, right? So you could say, you know, why do we care at all about doing this uh, formal hypothesis testing and, and running statistical tests and whatnot? Why can't we just, uh, you know, look at the outcome of the experiment and go with whichever treatment uh, scores highest or something, right? If, you know, conclude that that's what we should be doing. Um, and I gave you this exercise to hopefully prove to you that humans are bad at uh, estimating randomness um, and that basically we just cannot be trusted as a species. So, you know, it's, it's always more reliable to run some uh, formal test uh, to you know, have some level of confidence that whatever differences you observe are actually statistically significant, right? Rather than just uh, you know, not and, and not to be uh, trusted. So I did this and then I wrote a program to, let me see if I can show you this. Uh, Okay, so, oops. So I copied all of the uh, sequences that you all gave me, except for Aidens who was trolling. <laughs> so we discarded Aidens, but kept all of the other ones, all of the ones you gave me. Um, and I, computed the median length of consecutive sequences of the same digit. Okay, so you know how many ones in a row or how many zeros in a row did you each invent? Okay, and this is that distribution of human computed uh, sequences and has a median of four, a median of four. So now if you actually compare this to what a uh, random number generated that uh, you know, the computer would come up with, you would see that the uh, median length of these sequences the computer generates is actually five. Okay. So the idea is that uh, When most of you are inventing these random coin flips and you've gotten three or four of the same digit in a row, you know, something in our mind tells us that you have to stop and flip the next bit because it's, you know, it can't possibly be that you get so many of the same digit in a row. It seems really unlikely to the human eye that that would happen, okay? 
uh, and you're likely going to switch. So if, you, if you've seen four zeros in a row, the next digit you create is likely going to be one. Uh, except for Aiden, who is trolling and only has zeros for the entire sequence. He never, he never said explicitly that it's a hundred percent fair point. Like in statistics, you always say a fair hundred. You just said hundred. This coin could be a one-hot encoding, and that's what I do. So I, uh, well, I don't want to spend time on this now, but I, I bet you cash that it won't change anything because I'm actually looking at the median, not the mean. So I, it probably will not affect anything. In the in the outcome of this you know uh, demonstration okay uh, so i've done this a few times now and it works every time it's like magic right whenever we do this you know it, it always works out that the you know, human generated sequences tend to uh not really be random okay? so it's awesome so this is really you know a, a silly cute example for why we would rather do formal hypothesis testing and whatnot, uh, and formally analyze and compare the data we're collecting from experiments or otherwise, rather than just you know, visually or whatever, intuitively uh, interpreted, visually interpreted or something, informally interpreted. Okay, so you know, formal versus informal. Uh, it's because we're bad at uh, estimating randomness. Uh, okay, and then we talked about p values, uh, and I gave you this. Uh, we had this discussion of you know how the p value uh, you know is not the probability that the result you're observing is due to chance, which is maybe what you'd like to show, uh, but rather the probability that given some chance model results as extreme or more than the one you're observing could have occurred. So sort of the opposite. And I gave you this example of uh, yeah we we talked about this. I gave you this example of the coin flip. Where you know, let's say you're trying to uh, test the hypothesis, uh, you have a null hypothesis that the uh, coin is fair, meaning the probability of observing heads uh, or tails is the same, it's exactly half. Uh, and you know, otherwise, if the coin were biased, the probability of observing you know, heads or, or tails would be different than half. Um, and I showed you how. You know, so you toss it once, the probability of observing head is half, you toss it twice, it becomes a quarter, toss it three times, becomes an eighth, toss it four times, becomes a sixteenth. Okay. Uh, and that does not mean that the probability of the coin being fair is only a sixteenth. Okay, so the, the, you know, the p value is not the probability of uh, this outcome being due to chance. Which is ideally what you'd like to show, but that's not what the p value tells you. So, this is one of the most common misconceptions about p values. Uh, Hongbo was kind enough to uh, offer to prepare a quiz with this and other misconceptions about p values that he will be distributing shortly. Uh, okay, yeah, and you know, the explanation for this, you know, uh, if you have taken some class in statistics before, you've heard of this Bayes theorem. Uh, and so the relationship between these two probabilities that we have uh, illustrated just now and you know, how they're, they're actually different. Okay, yeah, so this is one of those other things. So you know, another way of saying the same thing, it is a common false belief that the probability of a conclusion being an error can be calculated from the data in a single experiment without reference to external evidence or the plausibility of the underlying mechanism. This is to say that the p-value doesn't tell you what you would like it to tell you. So another way of saying the same thing. Uh, okay, so there's actually lots of p-value misconceptions. You can find them here and or in the quiz later. Uh, and I won't insist on that. We talked about type one versus type two uh, errors just now. Okay, yeah, so um, the basic function of the statistical hypothesis tests we're running is to protect against being fooled by random chance. So really, they are typically structured to minimize type one errors. Okay, that, that was the uh, 
kind of error, the false positives, right? So there is in reality, no difference between conditions. In reality, there's no difference, but your study shows some difference. Okay, so it's a false positive difference. It shouldn't have been there. You're incorrectly discovering it. Okay. Um, so we call the this probability of making a type one error that's called alpha for some reason. Uh, it also goes by a different terms. Significance level is another term you will see this going by, or p-value is the most common term you will see this going by. Okay, so that is the probability of making a type one error, probability of false positives. Probability of making a type two error, false negatives, the other one, uh, is called beta. And the statistical power of a test is defined as one minus beta. So the uh, remaining probability, uh, probability of successfully rejecting a null hypothesis when it is false and should be rejected. Okay. So, uh, there's really no magic solution to this, but typically you'll see by convention that people are happy in practice with this 5% uh, p-value threshold. Uh, there's some history behind where this came about, but it's really basically just arbitrary. It's some convention that we all seem to agree to. It doesn't mean anything really more than that. Um, and to reduce type two errors, the best thing you could do is increase your sample size. So now let me show you uh, a really cool thing, Jenny. Uh, could you go back one slide? Of course. Um, so for alpha values, it seems like you're implying that another name that goes by is capital P value. It's it's not capital P; it's just P value. The the capital is means nothing. P, P, I, but then maybe I'm misunderstanding. Completely in front of your but didn't we also just talk about p values in a specific context? So it's going to change probability of chance, or at least the probability. So what's the difference between alpha and p value? Um, there, um, so there isn't any. So they, they, uh, alpha or p value are used interchangeably in statistical tests. Um, but the point I'm going to make here is that you don't know what this is a priori, but rather you, uh, by convention, you know, uh, decide you're okay with you know some low enough value for this thing. You don't know what the true value of this thing is, but by convention, you're saying you know I, I'm comfortable enough, right, trusting the results of this statistical test, if. This you know arbitrarily decided false positive rate is low enough, right? And that's on you to decide. And by convention, people have uh, historically used this five percent magic number uh, as the you know the value. Right? So if you're saying you know, we collectively agree that the, uh, the probability of false positives is uh, less than five percent, we're you know happy enough trusting that this is a sort of meaningful difference between whatever groups we're comparing. Okay, because we don't actually know, well, I mean, we, we estimate what this is from, you know, running the test, but we have to decide if it's low enough. So the trick is, you know, deciding what, what is low enough, right? You, you always have to interpret this, right? You, you know, you estimate the, the value of this uh, false positive rate, but you have to decide if it's low enough for your purposes, right? And I'm, uh, telling here that the convention is, you know, if it's low enough if it's five percent or or less. That's when it's considered to be low enough. Uh, but this is arbitrary. You just said it to be whatever you want it to be. There's not nobody stopping you from doing this. Right. Is there a reason why like, traditionally use the double negative in that? Why would you say like accept the good hypothesis? So it's easier to understand. No, uh, this is a good question. So this is basically what we've been talking about with what the p-value is and isn't. Um, so uh, we, I will refer you to some of the readings for today to kind of brush up on all of this, uh, but you cannot reverse it is the point. Uh, and I, I'll point you to 
stuff to read and more detail about this. Yeah, it, it's not just for dramatic effect. It, it doesn't actually mean the same thing that they use this terminology. Uh, okay. So let me show you this amazing thing. Okay, amazing thing. You ready? Get ready to be blown away. So imagine you have 20 predictor variables and one outcome variable, uh, and say they're all randomly generated. And you do 20 significance tests at alpha equals 5%, one for each variable. So probability of false positives, uh, 5%. So I'm asking, what is the overall probability for this entire analysis of making uh, at least one type one error? So observing at least one false positive. Does that make sense? The analysis consists of 20 individual tests. Each at 5%. Does anybody know? How do we think about this? Yeah, this is right, but is it one minus 0.95? One minus 0.95. Uh, you're going in a good direction, but no, it is not exactly what you think it is. And why do I have this annoying? Oh, by the way, folks on Zoom, I haven't seen the chat. So if there's stuff there. Yeah, please speak up. I haven't seen that. I'm sorry. Uh, don't feed the troll uh, is what Sam is saying. Okay. Let's go back here. So here's how I think about this. What is the probability that one of these uh, tests will incorrectly test, uh, will incorrectly show significance? This is four obvious probabilities. So hold on, this is not a trick question. So. 5%, right? So this is, I'm saying the same thing as I gave in the uh, problem description, all right? So uh, each of these tests has a false positive rate of 5%, right? I'm, I'm giving you that as input, right? So the probability that you uh, incorrectly show a statistically significant difference is what, 5% for each of these tests, right? I'm giving you that as input, okay? Um, does this make sense? So not a trick question yet. This is just the, uh, I'm, I'm stating the same thing again. Now I'm flipping this. So what is the probability that one will correctly, one test will correctly test non-significant? Yes, it's the complement. Okay. You see this? So, you know, if there is, oops. if there's no difference, but you falsely detect one, that was five percent. That's what we just talked about. Okay. And if there's no difference, and you correctly detect that there isn't one, right? Correctly test that it's not significant is the, the complement of this, right? So it's one minus 5% is, uh, you know, 0.95, okay? 
Yes? Okay, so far? You with me? Okay. So now I'm doing this 20 times, right? This was one test. I'm doing this 20 times. So the probability that all 20 of them will correctly test not non significant is the product of all of these. Okay, so you know it's 0.95 times 0.95, et cetera, et cetera, 20 times product of these. Okay, which happens to be 0.36. Okay, so far. So the probability that at least one of them will falsely test significant. I'm flipping this back to where I started. Okay, so it's one minus this, 64%. Yes, that's exactly it. that's what Krish said. Yeah, you couldn't see the parentheses and in the speaking. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I I saw parentheses where there weren't any, or oh. the other way around. I'm sorry. Yes, I I misinterpreted your answer. Uh, you were you're right. I stand corrected. Okay, yes, very good, excellent. So um, isn't this mind-blowing? You're more likely than not to find, to, to have false positives. Wild. Okay. So what do we do? It's hopeless. Multiple hypothesis tests or correction. Okay, yes. So that's one thing we do. I'll come back to just a second. Yes. We need to present multiple tests. Uh, elaborate. So if you see the micro, you'll get this result. You have multiple tests. What do you mean by multiple tests? So if you I was thinking if you run, you're saying if you run uh, the test 20 times, at least uh, at least one of them will uh, yield a, a false positive, at least, at least one of them. Yeah. But the other 19 will be. Oh, but these are different variables. I'm saying, oh, I see. you're right. So you, you're you know studying some complex phenomenon with lots of covariates. Uh, and you know the, the more variables you have part of your model or analysis, the more the likelihood of falsely finding effects where there weren't any, where there weren't supposed to be any, is the point. Uh, so yeah, how do, what do we, what else do we do? Yeah, Jenny? Well, okay, but I mean, you can't just remove variables if, if there's some good reason to have them in the first place, right? So uh, maybe they all have some, you know, theoretical reason to be there. They're somehow hypothesized to impact the, whatever, the phenomena. So you can't you can't throw them away. You you need them. We decrease the output. Right. So there's you know there's basically, I mean, there's not much you could do. The only thing you could do is be more conservative. Remember, this was only a, a convention. We said, you know, if it's if it's below five percent, uh, then it's uh, you know I'm confident enough that I can declare this meaningful. But that was a convention. So you know, the thing that people do is be a lot more conservative. Right? So there's various ways, Elijah was talking about this just now, there's various ways in which you uh, can correct for running multiple comparisons. You know, some are more conservative than others. But you know, basically you could say, uh, you know, you, maybe the most conservative is to divide this arbitrary 5% threshold by the number of comparisons you're running. So that would give you a lower, harder threshold to meet for statistical significance, right? So you know, that would be a way of correcting for this risk, right? You know, and, and there are others, but th this is something to keep in mind that the more you test the more you will discover statistically significant differences when there shouldn't have been any by just the mere fact of testing lots of things, lots of times. Okay. 
So this is, by the way, and I did not have Eat Unique for lunch today. Um, I did have an amazing Istanbul Grill uh, Turkish catering lunch at a faculty meeting. Amazing, highly recommended. Um, so this is why I hate seeing papers, right? So I, you know, I review papers all the time for like uh, conferences and whatnot, and I hate seeing papers that uh, you know measure all of the things that are measurable and then run statistics over all of them and then report some uh, significant difference somewhere without any justification for you know, why they're measuring the things they're measuring other than that they're measurable. Does that make sense? Uh, so because, you know, the, because the more things you test, the more you will find something, right? And if you don't argue that, you know, those things somehow meaningfully represent some theoretical construct that you actually care about, there's little value in that analysis, right? Okay, uh, end rant. Uh, okay, so any, any thoughts on this? Can you think of COVID testing? But that's the evolution. Yes. So, yeah, right. I'm like, the scenario you're doing is like 20 asymptomatic people. Everyone does a rapid test. Like, statistically speaking, if we all did rapid tests, but we are all didn't have COVID, one person would have a false positive. What would we do? Probably all take a test again or do PCR. Since, I don't know. That's like a grounded example that comes to mind. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good example. This is uh, p hacking, right? When they talk about p hacking, it's the same idea that you're you're just testing stuff until you find something with a low enough p, and then you report in the paper, and you're done. Uh, or go ahead. I was just going to ask a question because um, it wasn't one of the like opportunities that you gave us for our semester long project, like this this kind of like data set analysis challenge. Yeah. Where they're like, find something. Here's a bunch of variables. Find something. Yeah. I, I feel like wouldn't that be susceptible to this? Oh yeah, definitely. But you do it in a you know theoretically grounded way, and you you don't just compute pairwise correlations between all pairs of variables. But you sort of you know choose the ones that represent some phenomena you care about, and you argue that they're the right ones, and so on, and sort of do this in a principled way. You don't just throw all of them in some. Uh, R uh, model and see what comes out. Because that would get me to rant again, and you know, nobody wants that. Uh, with p hacking, so speaking of ranting, with p hacking, right? So what happens is, let's say you're the researcher, right? Um, and you, know, you have all of this data, right? So you, you know, you have all, you have access, you're the one that collected the data. So you're the one that computed all these variables. You're the one that ran all these tests. In the paper, right, you get you know one variable reported, or one version of a variable reported, and some statistical test associated with that. But like, who knows how many you actually, how many variations of that you actually ran offline, right? And just not talked about in the paper, right? So you know may, maybe you measure something in you know daily windows or one week windows or one month windows or six month windows or whatever and you know you end up reporting some results that are statistically significant with one version of this measurement right with some version of a test some version of a measurement but like maybe you ran 20 in the background right that you didn't tell us about uh you just you choose the one that happened to be statistically significant and then say anything about all the other 19 that you tried right that you know we've seen uh kind of how uh risky that can be okay so here's uh, a few cute things for the remainder just to get you excited uh, speaking of lying with statistics and numbers so there's this question you know let's say you're in a hotel room and they have these uh, uh, dark chocolate flavored hot cocoa uh, powdered uh, thingies in your room and you're like, you know, should you drink a hot cocoa before bed or not? Uh, and 
you're worried that you might not sleep if you do, but if you read this label carefully, it says 99.9% caffeine free. I don't know if you can read that, it's a little small. It says 99.9% caffeine free. Okay, so you're like, okay, so is it safe to drink or not before bed? Where you presumably don't want to stay up all night after drinking coffee, you know, late in the evening. Uh, if, if you saw this on the label, you know, what would you conclude? Seems harmless, right? I mean, probably, yeah, well, how 99.9% .9 caffeine free seems harmless. Um, so here's some back of the envelope math. Let's say you have a 20 ounce Starbucks drip coffee, uh, has 415 milligrams of caffeine. You can look this up. Um, there's about 21 milligrams of caffeine per ounce. One fluid ounce of water weighs about 28 grams. So a Starbucks drip coffee is about 0.075% caffeine by weight. So actually, strong coffee is also 99.9% .9 caffeine free. <laughs> Uh, and you know, presumably, you would choose not to drink a twenty-ounce Starbucks drip coffee right before bed. Uh, so you know, this is a cute illustration of how easy it is to lie with numbers and statistics. Um, see also the joke in the Slack channel from earlier. Uh, and really, uh, there's this amazing. I started the semester referring you to this. There's an amazing book and class at University of Washington called Calling Bullshit. You can find the book online and whatnot and the class materials. Um, and they talk about all of these in the book and, and much more and it's awesome, it's a great read. Uh, so I just stole this from the book, but it was a great example. Uh, here's another one, uh, a couple of years ago, the, this paper came out, uh, was you know, massively exciting. It said, tweeting about research papers uh, results in three times, three times more citations to those papers. And you know, before the study, so this was a proper randomized experiment, right? So true experiments, you can be confident that any differences there are really, you know, causal because they randomly assigned papers to being tweeted or not. Uh, and before this paper came out, when was this? 2020, yeah, just a couple of years ago. Before this paper came out, there has been some correlational studies of the impact of tweets on citations, but never an experiment. So this paper made a huge splash in all the popular media and whatnot, because it was the first you know, true experiment to look at this question. Uh, and they found that, you know, they found the claim you see there, three times more citations. Okay, that was the conclusion of the paper. That was the headline. And actually, so yes, it's true, right? It's true. It's an experiment. So you, you know, there's little you can uh, not trust here. But if you actually look at the size of these effects, okay, so on average, I think a year later, what they measured, these papers went from less than one citation on average to about three citations on, on average. So yes, you get three times more citations with tweets, but really you maybe get two citations on average extra, right? So a little misleading, right? So what's missing from the headline there on the left-hand side? Let me ask differently. Let's say you run some analysis and you run a statistical test and you get a super low p-value and you conclude that there's a meaningful difference between those uh, two groups. Uh, is that all there is to the story? Is statistically, statistically significant difference all there is to the story or is there more? And if so, what is missing? I see Luke. 
uh, I think the thing that's missing me is time sums. That's it. Okay, so you know, in your bag of tricks, if you remember only one thing from today's class, sort of thing, that bag of tricks, this is another one of those. Right, so there's two things you care about when you do, I don't know, data analysis. One is statistical significance, sure, right? Because you, you can't be trusted as a human. Uh, so we, we saw that earlier. But the other one is effect size, you know, to avoid maybe situations like these. The idea is that the more data you have, the larger your samples, the easier it becomes to observe statistically significant differences, even when they're practically insignificant so there's these two notions of significance there's a statistical significance which refers to p-values and there's a practical significance which refers to how large the effect is and whether that difference is practically meaningful in your domain right and this requires some domain expertise and interpretation All right so you know here you know one might say that two extra citations over a whole year is maybe not that meaningful. Or, or you could argue the opposite, but the point is you have to argue that, right? You, you can't just say that they're statistically significantly different. You also have to argue that that difference is meaningful in your domain, right? So sure, let's say you're using Copilot and you know, for a task that takes an hour on average, you save a minute and it's statistically significantly shorter, right? By one minute on average. Is that meaningful? Well, it takes you 59 minutes with Copilot, it takes you 60 minutes without. Right, so, you know, maybe you'll argue that not really, right? But the point is, you know, see how you can't do one without the other. You always have to do both. That makes sense. So you, I guess I'm saying you do practically meaningful if it's statistically significantly different. Does it make sense the other way around? Can it be practically meaningfully different without it being statistically significantly different? Like ever or just like yeah ever like what, what what would that tell you like if if there's a huge difference between the two groups but no statistical significance what does that tell you that it could, it could just be random what else it could be random what else could it be What kind of error would that be? What type of error would that be? Type one, false positives. Type two, false negatives. You false negatives. I'm with Elijah on this one. All right, so you, there's a practically meaningful difference. It's there, but you can't show it with your test. So you're, it's a false negative. You can't establish the statistically significant difference, even though it's practically there at present. I type two error. When does that happen? That's it. Low power, sample size is too small. So it's, it could be due to chance. If, if, if the sample is large enough, if you have high enough power that you could have detected that difference and you still don't, uh, or maybe it's chance, but otherwise it's probably a false negative. Okay. okay. Here's, oh, this is one of my favorites. Did you know that the majority 
of Hongbo's friends have more friends than he does? Isn't that counterintuitive? When does that happen? Okay, so suppose Hongbo follows Rihanna on Twitter and 499 other people and Rihanna has, I don't know, 100 million plus friends on Twitter. So the 500 people that Hongbo follows on Twitter will average at the very least uh, 200,000 followers each, right? On average, because you have this extreme outlier in there, Rihanna, okay? Uh, and you know, 200,000 is a lot more friends on Twitter than he has, right? So you know, hence the claim that most people have fewer friends than their average or mean friend has. So hopefully this makes sense. Are you ready? What if I told you he also has fewer friends than his median friend has? The reason the previous trick worked is because we had this one extreme outlier, Rihanna, say, and uh, you know, the average was super high because of that one outlier, but the median is robust to outliers. So how can this possibly happen? I'll let you think about this. You can tell me, tell me offline. I won't tell you. One more. Um, do you often have to wait a surprisingly long time for the next bus to arrive? There was a time when I lived on Fifth Avenue uh, and it would take me you know, about 15, 20 minutes to walk to campus back then, if I were to walk. And you know, sometimes I was lazy and I wanted to wait for the bus to come. And it would end up taking me longer because I would only take the bus for like two stops or something down Fifth Avenue, and then I would still have to walk down Morewood or whatever. Um, and it would take me longer to you know, ride the bus than uh, it would have taken to just walk to campus because I would have to wait for the bus. Okay? So I suppose you have buses that leave a stop at regular intervals, let's say 10 minutes. And if you arrive at an arbitrary time during this interval, you know, how long do you expect to wait on average before you catch the next bus question? on average, right? So sometimes you can arrive right before the bus comes, sometimes you can arrive right after the bus left, and you know, buses come every 10 minutes. Five, did I hear five? Yeah, five minutes on average. We expect it to wait five minutes on average, okay? Does that make sense? Do you agree? Yeah, okay, so I think so. Uh, so now, what if, buses leave uh, every 10 minutes on average, but because of traffic and whatnot, run somewhat irregularly. You know, so sometimes uh, the time between consecutive buses is short, sometimes it's longer, you know, it could be more than 15 minutes or so. Um, if you know, some bus was stuck in traffic and the other one caught up with it and whatnot, uh, would be short or otherwise would be long, et cetera, right? One, you know, the second one will be caught in traffic. So it'll arrive much later after the first one left, okay? It's still 10 minutes on average that these buses arrive. And now how long do you expect to wait? Still five? 
Who thinks till five? Anybody on Zoom wants to vote? Who think, yeah, Aiden? I'm, I'm just thinking it might even out because sometimes buses take longer, but then because of that, it will come faster at some point. Like, yeah, so seem like three buses come together. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying, I'm telling you that still, I guarantee that on average, buses uh, arrive or leave every 10 minutes. But sometimes, you know, on, on average, it's every 10 minutes. Sometimes it's right after one another. Sometimes it's longer than 10. Uh, you know, yeah, how, how do you have to? Be consistent with that kind of schedule. So you'll still say five, right? Yeah. Okay. So who else? Who else thinks five? I think it's it's intuitive. It's an intuitive answer. More than five. I just feel. Feels more than five. <laughs> the way you be asking. Question. <laughs> I know. I know. It's a two question. Okay. So it's because like the buses come up and when they do, you just take the first, one. and the other buses in the front become useless. Essentially, become duplicates of the first bus. So when buses for pumps, effectively buses take longer than buses. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So here's uh, here's another way of saying the same thing. I think. So I, I agree. I agree with Luke on this one. Um, you are more likely to arrive during one of the long intervals than during one of the short intervals. Okay. So as a result of this, you end up waiting longer than five minutes on average. Okay, so here's an illustration, right? So here uh, it's 16 minutes, 16, 16 minutes, followed by four minutes, followed by four minutes, followed by 16, another 16 and so on, right? So I'm still, I still have the 10 minute average, but I have the 16 plus four breakdown. Okay, so you have an 80% chance of arriving during one of the long intervals, in which case you would wait you know, half of that interval's length on average, so 18 minutes, sorry, eight minutes, 16 minute interval, you wait eight on average, 20% uh, chance of arriving during one of the short intervals, four minutes long, you wait two on average. Okay, so between these two, when you average them out, you end up waiting close to seven minutes on average overall. Uh, and I can confirm this, it was really annoying. Okay, so like imagine if my entire walk is like 15 or so minutes and I have to wait seven for the bus to come. Like, how does that make any sense? Uh, and then it's full or it doesn't even stop, right? <laughs> <laughs> like it, just, it drives by because it's full, like there's no more space in it. Uh, okay, so that was cute. Here's another one. Uh, the, this is, I'm showing you different musical genres on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the average age at death of musicians representing that genre. Uh, and I'm also plotting the uh, you know, average US life expectancy and it's broken down by binary gender here. Uh, and this is all before COVID, it went down drastically in the last three years. Okay. So you, this is a poor plot. I didn't make it, uh, but I can, which is why I can complain about it. It is a poor plot because you know these genres are categories. So having these lines be continuous between them is not meaningful. But you know, leaving that aside, uh, you can still observe, say, that rap and hip hop musicians. Uh, there we go over here. Uh, are uh, die at about half the age of performers in other genres. Like, why is that? I mean, a lot of musicians. Assume this result is like real, <laughs> like not just random from a simple bunch of categories. I would feel like it's probably the association of gang violence that's common in a lot of rap musicians, as yeah. less so more recent. 
that's that's fair. Fair assumption. What else? Is it the age at which the genre was created? Ah. Okay. Tricked you. Tricked you again. Uh, so let me illustrate this differently. Imagine you are tracking the life cycle of a rare chameleon on the island of Madagascar, uh, and you have a bunch of these chameleons. Each one is one of these horizontal lines, and you've been tracking them for a while, and uh, each of these lines represents their uh, lifespan. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, you have a whole bunch of individuals in your population, in your sample, that are still not yet dead at the end <laughs> of your study period. Okay. And you have, you know, so what do you do? You probably remove them, right? So what you're left with is the individuals that, you know, were young, right? And have also passed, you know, by the end of the study period. Maybe the gang violence argument you're making earlier. Okay. But it's really, it's not because of what you think, it's because of this right censorship, right? Because you didn't have enough, you know, chance to observe what would have happened to all of the other individuals that you excluded, you know, here from the analysis. Right, so it's a bit unfair to exclude these ones because maybe they would have ended up living for a super long time, right? So now you have a really skewed you know, impression of how long these comedians lived because at least for these recent ones, you're only observing the ones that you know, died tragically and, and uh, prematurely, right? So this is a biased representation of you know, what their actual lifespan is. So this is another one of those things, right? Censorship of data is another one of these tricks that uh, people have trouble with. You'll see this in papers all the time, how, you know, uh, I don't know, the researchers collect data up to point X uh, and then they make claims about whatever, age and lifespan and whatnot of open source projects or what have you uh, without accounting at all for this right censorship for the fact that these ones that are young may end up living forever for all we know. We just don't know. We haven't had a chance to observe their lifespan yet. Okay, so you can't just do this, that's the point. So there's actual, there are analysis techniques for right sensor data. So survival modeling is a common thing, a common approach that people use to, to model data like this, uh, you know, th that accounts for exactly this issue. Uh, Okay, so it's the same. This is what explains the uh, uh, genres idea. Okay, so we're beautifully on time for a change. I don't know what happened. Uh, I will end here uh, and invite you to read more about experimental design and statistics and pitfalls and some of these readings, um, especially if you haven't taken a class on stats recently. It'd be good to brush up on some of the like just background on like basic stats and, and so on. Uh, because I won't be covering that. I will uh, talk about linear regression modeling on Thursday, uh, and it would be useful if you have some uh, understanding of you know, basic statistics already. <laughs>